Hello, and welcome to the Population Reference Bureau's webinar launch for the 2012 World Population Data Sheet. I'm Wendy Baldwin, President and CEO of PRB. We are so pleased that you have logged onto our webinar today. We have over 300 participants from two dozen countries. And this is the 50th anniversary of our data sheet. The first was published in 1962 and included just four data points for 127 countries, a far cry from today. The 2012 data sheet brings you 19 population health and environment indicators for more than 200 countries. Many of us have relied on the data sheet our whole lives, and so it is a great honor for me to welcome you to this latest edition. Now, if you go to our website, prb.org, you can get the data sheet for fact sheets addressing topics from the data sheet and our interactive map and graphics. You can order print copies of the data sheet from PRB's online bookstore or by calling PRB. And now, Ellen Carnavali, our Vice President of Communications and producer of today's webinar, will review some important technical information about today's webinar. Thank you, Wendy, and welcome to all our participants. There are a few things to note before we begin. There will be no audio interaction during this webinar. You will hear the presenters, but they will not be able to hear you. If you would like to submit a question for Wendy or Carl, use the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Type in your question and click Send to submit it. We will respond to as many questions as possible after the formal presentation. If you have any technical problems with the webinar, please submit a question during the webinar and we will answer you immediately. We won't be able to answer all questions submitted, but we do promise to answer them all over the next few months in articles posted on the PRB website. If you are listening to this webinar using your telephone, we want to remind you that you will incur long distance charges depending on your telephone carrier. So we encourage you to listen to this webinar via your computer and its audio rather than through a telephone. We are recording this webinar. The recording, including the PowerPoint presentation, will be available on our website in a few weeks. If you have a mobile phone close by, please move it away from your telephone line and the computer. It can interfere with your ability to hear the audio from the webinar. Now I would like to introduce Carl Haub, PRB Senior Demographer and co-author with Toshiko Kaneda of this year's data sheet. Carl will begin our webinar by describing key world population trends. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy and Ellen. Well, let's get started by taking a, a little look backwards into the last, uh, into the last century. Now, in 1900, well, we don't go around thinking about what population was in 1900, so I won't say let's guess, but it was 1.6 billion. Now, that figure, we have to remember, took us 50,000 years of our history to achieve, to get that high. There may have been points in, in history where there was some doubt the human race would have even survived in its early, early days. We go forward only 100 years to 2000. Now let's take a guess. What do you think world population was uh, back in 2000? And a hint is there's a little statistical chicanery going on here of numbers changing places. 6.1. And one of the things I like about this is that it's easy to remember. Uh, 1.6 in 1990, 6.1 in 2000. However, is this not one of the most significant things, in some ways, one of the most fantastic things that has ever happened in world history? Certainly, it took all of our history to reach that first billion, which was back in 1800 or thereabouts. The second took 130 years. And then as we look, as we look further into the 20th century, we can see how that growth accelerated. In fact, the length of time it took to add the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh billion is really not, not all that different. They're virtually the same. Our real interest today is looking ahead. When will that eighth billion come? And it is going to come. At the moment, we might take a guess and say 13 years. But it could easily become sooner than that. It might even take less than the seventh, might take 11 years, who knows. 
Now here's a picture that really has not changed very much in the past few decades, that all population growth is going to be in the developing countries. But there is a bit of a change, and we've tried to show it. Notice the least developed countries. These are a subset of the developing countries, uh, many in sub-Saharan Africa, but others uh, around the world in different regions. These are the ones with the lowest income and usually things like the lowest education. But there is a, another change here in that birth rates have come down in many developing countries. So the difference here is the question mark is we're looking at what is going to happen to fertility in the poorest countries and when is it going to start to come down if it hasn't and if it has started to come down in a country, will it continue? There is one other little difference that's not very obvious. The developed countries down at the bottom, and that's basically Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, and New Zealand, their projection is actually lower than it was, and we'll see why in a moment. So, a pretty simple title. Pure countries are growing, rich countries are not. Basically, that tells it all. I look over there at uh, Europe, for example. Uh, about 700 million at the present time, and the same figure, actually slightly less, uh, is expected for the year 2050. However, that simple number of 0.7 uh, hides a, a, a fairly important uh, fact. Sure, the population size of Europe, and in, in many ways North America, will not grow or remain the same, but they will also get much older, and that is a very key issue these days. Looking at it another way, look at the area where population growth is projected to be the greatest. Sub-Saharan Africa would even outgrow Asia, uh, growing by 1.2 billion. Of course, Asia will still be bigger, but the addition that Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to make is truly astounding. But we have to put a little footnote on that. Sub-Saharan Africa's growth will be larger than this, larger than that 1.2 billion, if the birth rate does not come down. And that's something we'll look at in a minute or two. Now every uh, demography student right early on learns about the famous population pyramids. And here's the pyramid for the developed countries, for the rich countries. A population pyramid is a kind of simple graph. It shows the age structure of, of a country or a region. Uh, with males on the left and females on the right, starting with the youngest group, ages 0 to 4, who were obviously born in the last five years. Now, one thing we notice about this pyramid is that it isn't a pyramid. To keep up the, uh, shall we say, the, uh, the Egyptian analogy, let's just call it an obelisk. Where are the young people in this pyramid? And in the world, where are the young people? Well, we found them. This astounding difference in the two pyramids, and this one really does look like a pyramid, it is an exact scale uh, representation comparing the developing countries, the poor countries, uh, with the rich. Now, one thing we can say about those two pyramids is the one for the rich countries, it has a destiny in it. It has a, a kind of pre-programmed decline. There is no way, unless there is an enormous increase in the birth rate, that those countries can grow. But here, the developing countries, their future is not certain, not certain at all. We do know that uh, there's a very large number of young people, and those young people will become the parents of tomorrow. What we don't know is how many children they will have, and that will make a very, very large difference. All of this has led to what we call the demographic divide. And here, I think it's pretty dramatically shown by comparing a developing country and a developed country of about the same population size, Tanzania and Spain, both 48 to 46 million today. Uh, but look at the size of population projected for 2050, which is not that far away when you think about it, 138 million for Tanzania and Spain barely growing at all. And we do know that any growth in Spain from here on out is likely to come mainly from immigration. The number of births, I think, is another dramatic number. About 1.5 million more births in Tanzania every year than in Spain. 
So here's another way of looking at where the young people are. Dropping down a bit down that table, let's take a quick look at the population below age 15 and 65 plus. Uh, you know, I started doing this data sheet in 1980, and African countries, most of them, and it continues today, had that same proportion, 45% below 15, 3%, 65 and over. That's a long time not to have that to change. When we look at Spain, we see the inverse. A very small percentage of, of, uh, of young people below the age of 15, and the elderly actually have a higher percentage. But the story gets even more interesting. Look at the population age 65 plus projected for the year 2050. Tanzania's would barely grow. Even in 2050, only 4% would be above the age of 65. In Spain, one-third of the population. This is something that I don't think has ever happened before. In fact, it never has. To have such a large proportion of the population above the age of 65. On this chart, um, I take a look at the right-hand side first. Look at Europe. The number of births and deaths today are just about in balance. In other words, there isn't any growth coming from what we call natural increase, births minus deaths. And the situation is growing more and more similar in North America. Uh, it is the uh, developing regions where births greatly outnumber deaths primarily due to larger numbers of young people and higher birth rates. But those differences are really stark. This is something that demographers, I think, and probably any other sociologist never would have expected to see. This is an unprecedented decline uh, in birth rates. It's not caused by famines, wars, or any big outside influence. Look at Germany. Germany fell below two children per woman which is the level, of course, needed to sustain population growth in the early 70s. That's, that's a long time ago. And it dropped below 1.5 in the early 80s and has stayed there ever since. When this happens in a country, don't you think their future has been pretty well set? And the same is true in much of the rest of Europe. Uh, Italy uh, followed Germany's lead, although it took a little longer. Uh, but still, it's down below 1.5 children per woman with a diminishing number of young people. France looks a little bit different. Uh, one of the reasons, I think, why you see the gap there between France and the other two, France averaging around two children, is that France has done an, historically quite a good job of supporting young, young couples uh, in the raising of their children, where such has really not been the case in many other countries of Europe although concern over population decline and aging is beginning to change that, and the countries are beginning to look hard at ways to encourage young people to have children. Here we see a, a population pyramid of Japan today, and it was interesting to look at that for all developed countries earlier, but now we can, it's also interesting to look at an example. And look at Japan. First of all, the birth rate isn't rising. If it were, perhaps the bottom of that pyramid might get wider and wider, but that simply is not happening. So we can see here, again, pre-programmed. Aging and population decline are pre-programmed into the pyramid, and in demography, it has a certain destiny to it. Turning quickly to the U.S., the U.S. has been famous, at least it's certainly been famous in Europe, for having what they consider to be a high birth rate, although you can see that uh, in the past few years, the U.S. birth rate has fallen, and that I think basically shows that we're not recession-proof. And a good deal of that drop has come among immigrants uh, to the country, especially Hispanics. Will that turn around when the economy improves? My own opinion is it probably will. Perhaps it won't. And if Europeans look at the U.S. and they think that we have a very young population, that's somewhat true. But when we look at what we still call the old traditional majority population, the white non-Hispanic group, you can see that the pyramid of that group looks very much like a European country with a dwindling number of youth. It's the Hispanic population and other minorities that keep us young. Uh, and this is something that European companies, European countries are beginning to grapple with a bit. 
more immigration to bring in younger people and workers and consumers or, or not. So before I'd mentioned that uh, in the case of, say, Africa, that we assume in projections that the birth rates will come down and that they will do so smoothly and without interruption. Why is something we can hold for the discussion period? But here are some trends in African countries, and I think you can see that in many cases that that simply is not happening right now, that birth rates are staying rather high in African countries, and even when they come down, they have some tendency to slow down at a level in the middle, say for around four children. Uh, Ghana, as you can see, has suddenly be begun to, uh, uh, to bring its birth rate down. And here is an important point. When you project populations, how in the world can you guess ahead exactly what is going to happen? And that slow fertility decline is not unique to Africa, but also seems to be uh, uh, endemic in, in a fair number of other developing countries. Take a look at Pakistan, uh, just above uh, four children at the present. If you were to draw a line and try to guess when Pakistan would reach that two-child level, what do you think you might come up with? Pretty far, I think, into the future. There are some ways to evaluate the or guess, I, I should say guess, really, not evaluate what the future might be. In surveys, women are asked how many children they say are ideal. This is not always the greatest indicator because one does not always have your ideal number of children, but looking at this does at least give us some idea of what uh, childbearing preferences have been. And again, the same thing in countries that have lower birth rates, like Egypt and Indonesia and Jordan. Uh, there still seems to be a fairly strong desire for more than two children, and that's a very important point in demography. The next two pyramids of, of Malawi, and they really bring home the effects of poverty uh, in a country. This is the wealthiest one-fifth of Malawi, and when we say wealthiest, most of these people are not rich. They're just not in the poorest segment. But we do see that there's been a drop in the birth rate. Look at zero to four and it's smaller than five to nine. The dramatic difference between this one and the next one, the poorest fifth of Malawi's population is really obvious, and we probably don't even have to discuss that one any further. But look at the number of youth. So how do, would birth rates come down in developing countries? Well, that's not really rocket science. If, if women and couples decide to use family planning, if they have it available, if they're educated in its use, uh, they can, if they choose, bring the birth rate down. But here's a graph showing women who say that they would like to use family planning, but they aren't. And here we have again that poorest fifth and that richest fifth dichotomy. It's the poor who are, do not have access to family planning, generally speaking. And lastly, we'll take a look at a very important issue. And quantify, we talked before about how uh, developed countries are aging. Now, in this graph, we put age 60 plus, just to be different, but also because, in, in truth, 60 is a more, a more realistic retirement age for many countries. And look, for example, at Japan, 42% above 60 and over, Germany, 38. And by the way, these projections assume that the birth rates of Japan and Germany will increase. In developing countries, India is a country that will have some growth in its population ages 16 and over, but even by the middle of the century, it will not be as big as the other two, Japan and Germany. So these, these things have tremendous consequences if we go back to earlier in this, in this segment that we talked about when do we reach 8 billion. And that is an issue that we will soon begin to learn the answer to. And much of it depends on what happens to fertility, to the birth rate in developing countries, and obviously to the access that they have to family planning. So now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Wendy, to Wendy Baldwin, who is going to be speaking about something that may seem rather new in developing countries, non-communicable diseases. Thank you, Carl. You've heard a lot about fertility, but let's talk about mortality patterns for a moment. 
When we think about the low and middle income countries or the developing countries, we all know the terrible burden that infectious disease present, malaria, TB, AIDS, and others. But what is changing is the growing importance of non-communicable or chronic diseases. These are the diseases that are already the big drivers of mortality in the wealthier countries. Diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. But now these are the leading causes of death worldwide and account for most deaths in the low and middle income countries and their impact is increasing. Let's look at the regions of the world and take a peek into the near future. Today in high income countries, 87% of deaths are to the non-communicable diseases but these account for more than half of the deaths in the other regions with the exception of Sub-Saharan Africa. And if we looked at 2030, which is not all that far away, there's a tremendous growth in the role of non-communicable diseases worldwide and even in Sub-Saharan Africa where almost half of the deaths will be to NCDs by 2030. The World Health Organization has identified four diseases that are driving these trends. They are diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory diseases, and most cancers. And these diseases share four risk factors, behaviors that are responsible for over half the risk of disease. And they are tobacco use, diet, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and excessive alcohol consumption. Now, of course, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of chronic diseases. The World Health Organization's focus on these four is important for several reasons. Partly, it is because that there are behaviors that are associated with these diseases that can be modified. And there are examples of effective programs, but of course, programs have to be tailored to specific settings. These shared risk factors are behaviors that are often exacerbated by urban living, and the developing world is the urbanizing world. And these are behaviors that are started during youth and adolescence, typically alcohol and tobacco be use begin then, or where it would be preferable to support positive behaviors early in life rather than try to change entrenched habits decades later. And so that means there can be a focus on a critical age group that has real potential to reap benefits for decades. What else do we know about the growth in non-communicable diseases in developing countries? They tend to strike earlier in life than in the wealthier countries. In South Asia, the mean age of first heart attack is six years earlier than the rest of the world. And because they strike earlier, they carry a greater burden on families since they may affect breadwinners. And that economic impact carries through to the country level, not just from the impact on the labor market, but in terms of health care costs. These are the diseases that create massive burdens on the health care systems and where a little prevention would be a welcome step for future economic and personal well-being. The world population data sheet always includes some new measures in addition to the core measures of population change. In 2000, we added measures of AIDS, and in other years, we've added measures of the aging population, nutrition, population density, urbanization, or the economy. This year, we included measures of NCD mortality for the countries of the data sheet and a fact sheet to go with it. Through the World Population Data Sheet, we bring you the best, most up-to-date information about population issues around the world and highlight those issues that will increasingly require our attention. Non-communicable diseases is just such an issue. I hope you find the 2012 data sheet interesting and useful, and now we will begin our question and answer session. Please remember to submit questions through your question toolbox and not through the chat function. Okay. We have the first question, which is, why does the Population Reference Bureau have a higher number of people added to the world population than the UN figures? This difference seems significant. Here, let me, let me have Carl answer that. Why, sure. Um, ac actually, the uh, number we use is not that different from a lot of other organizations. Uh, the UN uh, has today about 78 million people added to the world population. We're about 6 million higher than that. Uh, one of the reasons, certainly, is that uh, we are able to uh, incorporate the results of more recent surveys, some of which show that uh, total fertility rates or birth rates haven't come down. So that's, you know, that's one reason. Uh, the other is the weighting of population sizes. But, I, but the questioner, I think, 
he was more concerned about the future. And uh, that certainly is something I think that you can tell from our earlier presentation is a bit of an unknown. Uh, there is no guarantee that the number of people added to world population is going to decline. And that, that goes beyond the obvious of what happens in China and India. Uh, largely what happens in, in Africa and in bigger de developing countries like Indonesia, Pakistan and, and such. So we're really actually fairly close when you think about it. Oh, I might add one thing, one thing as well, is the United Nations issues a, s a series of population projections, not just one. Uh, we all, we all have, a, you know, we have a natural tendency to use the middle series, certainly. Uh, but the UN also shows w what would happen under different scenarios, such as high and low. So, long answer, sorry. Thank you, Carl. Um, we have another question about why the focus is now on uh, non-communicable diseases. Is this a new problem or a newly recognized problem? That's a great question. I think what we could say safely is it's a growing problem. So we've seen this increasing in the, in the developing world. It's really just recently reached um, such high levels. And that high level has influenced the World Health Organization to issue a major report and also for the UN to hold a special session devoted to how non-communicable diseases are affecting the um, developing countries. They've only done that once before. That was 10 years ago when they had a special session on AIDS. So I think that is a signal to how timely that issue is right now and how it's been, been recognized. Um, now I'm going to pass the, the, the baton back to Carl for a question about net migration rate. Uh, in the world population data sheet for the U.S., when we talk about migration, does that include both legal and illegal immigration? Uh, yes, it actually does. We use the Census Bureau's estimate and uh, the Census Bureau does, does not differentiate between legal and illegal. So, uh, well, some people will think that uh, it's too low or it's too high. Uh, it does include illegals, at least tacitly. Okay. Another question here is, in view of the impending climate catastrophe, should PRB stress the urgency of slowing population growth? Well, you know, the PRB motto is inform, empower, advance. And we believe that population issues are very important for both individual and countrywide and global well-being. And our role is to make that data available in ways that individuals, countries, communities can make decisions. And so that is really one of the things that motivates us to make sure that the best data are widely available so everybody can understand these issues, understand these problems, and make their decisions about what they would do. Uh, Carl, I've got a question here for you about um, resources. Well, do you think the population growth, since it's unprecedented, will be um, a tremendous demand on the resources of the Earth, and will those resources be exhausted? Well, I think they could be. Uh, it, it, of course, depends on how many, on, on how large the population grows. Uh, at the moment, for example, as, as, far as, as far as I've ever known, there is enough food in the world. Uh, the problem is poverty and people not be able to get it. Uh, if we went beyond, say, 10, 12 billion, I think we'd probably have, have to have some advances in production and perhaps some changes in diet. Uh, but I'm certainly, I'm certainly no expert on that. Uh, I think here at PRB, we give you the numbers to do the first thing that Wendy mentioned is to in inform. And I think people draw their own conclusions based upon that. I'd like to call your attention to our food security bulletin that's posted on our website, which actually will give you, you know, a little more information and analysis about uh, food issues. And uh, we've also posted a Malthus lecture on the, in the interaction between population growth and resources and food security. And I think both of those would be informative and kind of help see what some of those choices are. Now, oh, Carl, here's a great question for you.
Uh-oh. Yeah, <laughs> I, you asked for it here. You already suggested that poverty and wealth influence fertility. Might gender equity be a more influential factor? Oh, certainly. Um, I mean, more or less hard to say. Uh, but definitely since women in many developing countries have no say over their old, ch their old childbearing, uh, in many developed countries, women do not even have a say over visiting the village or leaving the house. Uh, th I mean, that's, that's one of the key things. Uh, in India, for example, there, it's, it's no coincidence that uh, some of the lowest fertility is in the state of Kerala in the south of India, where women ha have had equality or near equality for a very, very long time, but no question. Uh, one of our listeners has asked about whether looking at the growth that we've shown for the population in Sub-Saharan Africa and the levels of poverty, whether that's going to make Sub-Saharan Africa a, a force in driving future global migration. Um, very interesting question and one where, you know, I think what we know about migration is that people often migrate short distances. Uh, it's not clear what the migration patterns would be. Um, Africa is an enormous continent, and there certainly will be a lot of migration within Africa, and there is already some migration out of Africa and remittances sent back to Africa. So that's certainly a possibility, and it builds on what we see now, but it's a little hard for me to picture that being a massive change. What do you think, Carl? Uh, no, I think, no, I think you're right, too. Um, the uh, I think many people talk about when they talk about Africa's migration. They frequently are talking about to Europe, and uh, that has dropped off, and for many reasons. Uh, one certainly is the the lack of jobs in 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 Europe. Uh, like within Europe, we have people leaving Ireland who had gone there. Uh, so you know, no jobs, no remittances, no migration, and there is some there is some resistance to uh, migration from other cultures. I mean, there is. We, have, we know that. Now, someone has asked about women's empowerment programs, and this sort of ties to something Carl already mentioned here. So the question is whether we've looked at those programs and how they might specifically impact population growth. What empowerment programs really work? Well, one of the first things we usually look at in terms of women's roles and women's empowerment is education. So probably the strongest evidence um, exists for simply ensuring that girls get into school, that girls stay into school, and not just primary school, that they're able to stay in secondary school, that they're able to actually have enough skills that they could be active in the marketplace. So the programs, there are a lot of individual programs that do short-term interventions, and I think they can build some individual skills. Um, there are a number of those, and a number of those are reported in briefs that we have on our, on our website. Probably the most critical one is going to be education, and then the access to employment to make use of that education. Okay. okay. Okay, I have a long question here. I'm going to have to read through this whole question, but it looks really interesting here. Does the PRV data sheet address the growing importance of the demographic dividend in countries now experiencing lowering fertility? The resulting youth bulge is creating high unemployment in many countries and growing internal and external migration. Are there data on the changing youth age structure that affect the population distribution? I think that youth bulge question is really <laughs> interesting. Carl, you get it first. Oh yeah, sure. The, uh, I mean, the demographic dividend has gained a, a certain amount of popularity, but I think it's also we have to consider, uh, well, let me just say first what it usually is, that uh, it means that there's a concentration of younger people in working ages and fewer people, say, below the age of 15, so that you have a concentration of people in the ages who can be productive, and that's all well and good. The age structure can be there, uh, but in many cases, the jobs aren't there. If there's no jobs, then there's no dividend. Uh, and if the labor force is not educated, it doesn't have skills or qualifications, uh, 
then it doesn't exist. So two things have to go together. And I'm afraid that in many cases, they aren't there. But we certainly have seen dividends in some of the Southeast Asian countries where fertility declined and that bulge in the youth population combined with education and combined with more economic opportunities really has been a growth engine for those countries. So I think it's interesting to see how different countries adapt to lowering fertility, how they take advantage or don't take advantage of a youth bulge. There's nothing sort of automatic. Sometimes it, 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 it can sound like these demographic changes are sort of automatic and they're pre-programmed and we know how it will all turn out. And, oh, that's really not the case. And the demographic dividend is a great example of that. Um, on the one hand, it describes a very specific demographic change, but it doesn't automatically lead to the kind of benefit that sometimes is attributed to it. So we have to put that demographic change in a broader context and say, is, the, is that country going to be preparing their young people to be economically active? And are they going to be preparing their country for economic growth? And that may go to the policies about imports. It may go to policies about growing businesses. There are a lot of things that have to happen for a demographic process like the dividend to have the kind of broad economic impact that we would all like to see. Yeah, and I think that the examples that uh, Wendy gave are, are countries where both of those things did come together. Now we've got a clo question closer to home here. So thinking about Mexico and the neighboring countries as well as the U.S., the question is, now that fertility has declined in Mexico and in neighboring countries, will migration from those countries to the U.S. decline or even reverse itself? I, uh, yeah, I, this has been brought up many times before, uh, that in fact, uh, Mexico has a lower birth rate than do Mexican immigrants to the United States. So I think one, one thing that tells us is Mexico still has a large enough poverty population uh, that they have plenty, uh, plenty of uh, what demographers call pull factors in the U.S., in other words, a higher income. So I, I, it's not so much the birth rate, but it's, it has to be combined with uh, with uh, a reduction in poverty and say a, a real move, real a real move, not an imagined one, into the middle class. We have a question about the um, countries that have the target birth rates below two women, two children per woman. I don't know any countries that actually have that as a target now. Do you, Carl? No. Oh, no, I never, no. There's certainly a lot of countries that have average number of children below two, but that's not the same thing as there being a specific target, would you say? Usually the, the, target, the target is uh, two children per woman if the country is, is above that. Uh, now, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, China, of course, has rather rigidly enforced its one-child policy, which, and the way it works out, is actually a one and a half child file policy, and South Korea, sometime back in the 60s, did in fact uh, they were pushing the idea of one child. But generally speaking, that's kind of unheard of. Now we have a question about um, unmet need. So, Carl, you mentioned unmet need, but the question is kind of about can we unpack that a little bit? And maybe I could take a run at that one. Um, really, there are a lot of different reasons that people might have unmet need for, for family planning. They might have fear of side effects. Um, they might feel that they're not at risk. They might be able, not able to get the methods that they want. And so it's, um, it's very interesting that there's been a renewed interest in kind of reaching those women and their partners who have said, yes, they would like to lower their fertility and they'd like to use contraception, but they're not. And what we're seeing is that's, that's a little complicated question. And there are implications there for what kind of health service delivery there is, what kind of access to methods, the, the confidence that if you start a method, you can keep using it. Um, and then sometimes there are personal objections, either from 
maybe from the wife or maybe from the husband. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to see movement on addressing that unmet need. And there was just a family planning summit in London that addressed just those issues and led by the Gates Institute and the British aid institution Diffin that's really looking to see a renewed commitment to meeting those needs and to supporting family planning, especially in the, the poorest countries. And one of those countries is Niger. Um, question here about do we think there is any successful programs in Niger for reducing the cultural preference for many children? I have not really heard of anything uh, like, like that in Niger, um, but from some demographers I know who have worked there, uh, I honestly have to use the word pessimistic, that they really don't see uh, any great decrease uh, in fertility in the near future. But, uh, but again, I'm, I'm kind of relying on what people who work there told me. So what do you think, now Carl, I'm going to give you a speculative question here, thinking ahead. What do you think the world will be like if it attains population stability throughout? What if we have a, a global obelisk instead of a population pyramid? What do you think that might mean for us all? <laughs> well, there's, sure, there's been speculation about what happens if what has happened uh, in the developed countries happens in the developing. Well, I think we actually saw the answer, uh, that we would have a, a, a population top-heavy with the elderly. So we all have opinions and I guess I can I guess I can have one too. I I don't I don't see that happening. I don't see South Korean fertility or Spanish fertility uh, coming to Pakistan and you know perhaps even Malaysia, who knows. But my guess is this drop in the long run is going to be a, a truly European thing. And I'm sure that will could, could start a big discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for the questions to flow in. <laughs> we do have one question about infertility. Do you think infertility would be a problem for the growth and the development of nations? Well, there is certainly a level of biological infertility that all populations experience. Um, but it's hard to see that as being a problem sort of at the level of the development of nations. It certainly is a, a problem and often a, a very serious one at the individual level, at the couple level, but not so much at the national or global level. Do you agree? Yes, I think you're right. Okay. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We're still waiting for questions. Uh, and one here is about the cultural origins of family planning unmet need as to whether religious orientation makes a difference um, in Africa. Well, you know, religious orientation is an interesting question. When, when I started my career looking at fertility in the United States, there was a lot of work on the difference between fertility levels and practices for Catholics and non-Catholics in the U.S. And that has vanished. It just doesn't exist anymore. And right now we see in Sub-Saharan Africa, we generally see higher fertility among Muslims than non-Muslims. But again, cultural preferences, they're not, you know, they, they are not written in stone. These are, these are influenced by religious beliefs, but they're also influenced by social practices, culture, economic conditions. Boy, I wouldn't want to go ahead and predict what the future would be like for retaining any of those those differentials. Okay. But also, too, I think that cultural and religious influences go hand in hand. Uh, sometimes you can't separate religion from a culture. Uh, and the DHS surveys, the Demographic and Health Survey, uh, does ask reasons for not, not using family planning. And uh, it's not mentioned much, but religion, I believe, is, is one of those. So it, there is some information. Mm -hmm. But also that, that famous response, as many as God sends, that has a bit of a ring to it, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there certainly are still some differentials. I would just say I think that needs to be looked at really carefully to look at what the elements of that are, what's driving that. And um, it, it's a, that's a complicated question, and I'd be careful about talking about what we'd expect to see in the future. And, you know, actually, uh, an example that most people wouldn't think of is Germany, 
which uh, in the north is has been more heavily Protestant, and the south, Bavaria, more Catholic and uh, more practice of religion, mm -hmm. and birth rates low everywhere in Germany, but it's a little bit higher in, in some areas of Bavaria. But it's certainly low in Spain, in France, in Italy. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, Question that you you know you posed a, a question about retirement age and showed sixty as a retirement age instead of sixty five and yet one of our listeners has pointed out that gee wait a minute if life expectancy is increasing in a lot of countries shouldn't we be talking about retirement at seventy instead of sixty five what do you think about that you're not retired uh, well, well actually I half am but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, me. <laughs> well yes that's true the um, um, yeah. I knew someone was going to mention that. But, you know, there, tell that to the retirees. The European countries have been trying to raise retirement ages, and they hit a stone wall. And think of the taxes that Europeans pay, 40%, 50%, and they are expecting something at the end of the line. Now, it may turn out that the promise has been too generous, but uh, people are really going to resist that. Well, and I think if we look at the disability literature, from certainly from the United States and from, from Europe, we would see that it's true life expectancy has increased, but it's also true that the disability-free years have increased. So people are living longer, but they're also living healthier to later ages. So when we talk about how you know, life expectancy has increased, it's not like at 65 people are all just decrepit and don't want to work and can't work. A lot of people can work. They're healthier than they used to be. And we see that. We're documenting that in the United States and in Europe. But I think that's a trend we would expect to see move around the globe. Uh, true, certainly. But I, um, in most countries of Europe, it's really the late 50s on average. And the people there are really looking forward to travel, maybe to move to the south of Spain, that type of thing. So that's an expectation they've had their whole life. And to push it back, say, five years, I boy, that would cause problems. And as one of our listener points out, Bangladesh demands that public employees retire at age 60, and actually a number of international organizations do the same. So does the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, someone here has asked whether unmet need for family planning might change with higher education levels and increasing urbanization. I think that's a very good bet. Uh, increased education and urbanization frequently means that individuals and couples have more access to information about family planning, they have more access to services, and they are better able to make use of those services. But it's also in many ways easier to uh, provide family services, family planning services in, a, in an urban area than in a remote rural or sparsely settled area. So I think that would be a, that would be a good way to to, uh, to expect things to move. Now, back to our disabilities question. Someone has asked whether aging disabilities aren't more severe in the developing countries than in the northern nations, and I think that is certainly uh, true. Uh, the change that we've seen in the U.S. and in the, the wealthier countries uh, is not yet seen in most of the developing world, and as we pointed out on the discussion of non-communicable diseases, these diseases tend to strike earlier in the low-income countries. Uh, they come with a period of morbidity or illness leading up to, to those deaths. They're, that burden of disability is still very high in the developing world. And I think that really was in part the point about looking at the population over 60, because that's probably much more realistic in much of the, in much of the globe. Now here's a question that goes back to the non-communicable diseases as well about whether this increasing rate of non-communicable diseases among the younger population will affect fertility. That's a very interesting question, but I don't know that anyone has specifically looked at it, but I think it's unlikely. The rise in non-communicable diseases is still at ages that are after most childbearing. And while there is some influence of nutrition and lifestyle on uh, fertility and ability to conceive, it's not really dramatic. So even with an increase in the risk factors, 
I think it's unlikely that we would see that connect back to um, a change in the fertility rate. Um, Carl, you might want to think about the sub-Saharan Africa and infant mortality for a minute. Um, what do you see as a trend there? Oh, down. Down. Definitely down. And it's actually been quite dramatic in many of the demographic and health surveys that, uh, I mean, an infant mortality rate of 50 infant deaths per thousand live births is not that rare anymore. Uh, and infant mortality often is one of the mortality factors that comes down early, early in the early in the game. And it also statistically, it also has an, an important effect on life expectancy at birth, which may seem obvious, but I just thought I'd mention it. Well, that's an interesting connection between mortality and fertility. I mean, many would argue that you families want to see that infant mortality rate come down. They want to know the children they have are going to survive to set the stage for thinking about lowering the number of births that they have. So it can raise their confidence in the health and the well-being of the children they bear. Uh, so these two, these two really are pretty tightly interrelated. Well, that's true as long, you know, as, long as people have notice it. <laughs> and, that, and that may take a while. Unfortunately, they don't go around reading uh, survey reports very often. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we still have work to do to so share still, information. Yes, That's we do. Good. Excellent. Now, one more, uh, listener has commented on whether AIDS and TB have actually curbed fertility trends. And, you know, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, there really was concern that this was going to have an impact on Africa in that it would change the population growth trends, that it really could lead to declines in population. And we really haven't seen that. Well, we haven't, we haven't seen the declines that people were concerned about in the early 1990s. Uh, I used to get questions saying that uh, Africa's population will be cut in half. And fortunately, that's not the case, uh, partly because the countries that have had the highest HIV prevalence are actually fairly small. Uh, so it, it was a bit over exaggerated, but, but when you have countries in Africa, even today, where 15% of the people, of the adults, have had HIV, that's pretty awful. And it has had some effect on fertility because of mortality of men and women. And uh, as far as I know, there, there, there have been some studies as well on some, some sterility, but, uh, but I, I don't think that's ever been really conclusively proven. Okay, uh, now we have a question about the impact of regional conflicts. Now that's important. We have many parts of the world where there are significant regional conflicts and that could affect the projections of those populations. But maybe that isn't big enough to actually have an effect. Are you able to take into account the kind of conflicts that go on within a region or across countries and looking at their population projections? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, past estimates of countries have certainly taken that into account. Uh, I'll just give one example was Rwanda and Burundi in the middle 90s, and the mortality there was included uh, in, in the estimates. But now projections, that's a totally different, different thing. Very few people try to project or make some guess ahead as what the mortality might be from some civil war that has not yet happened. Okay. Um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I am just so pleased that you've been able to join us for this webinar for our 2012 World Population Data Sheet. Uh, every year we publish the data sheet, we publish associated materials, and each year it kind of gets better and better. There are more tools, there's an interactive map, there are policy briefs and data sheets, and I can tell from the questions that have come in today that you have a lot of interest in the kind of topics that we address all the time. We've tried to give you quick answers as you've raised these questions, but I just want to um, suggest that you take a look at our website, that's prb.org, because there's a lot of information available there, and I think you'll find it very interesting. It's very accessible. There are ways to get in there and kind of look at the data profile on individual countries. There are ways to type in a search function, type in the topic you're interested in. Maybe it's child marriage. Uh, maybe it's climate, maybe it's food security, whatever. 
type that in and take a look at the material that's on there. And we publish new content to the website about every three weeks. So I thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been uh, just so much fun to have questions come in to know that people are really interested in these topics and thinking about them. So thank you very much and goodbye.